What's up, everybody? It's Chris DiStefano, a.k.a. Chris Dereed DiStefano. Welcome to Chris Dereed's. I've had enough of Yas Queen. I want to start talking about kings, and I want to talk about my favorite short king who got wild with his power, sent nasty little DMs to his wifey, and tried to take over the world. The original little stinker, or should I say little stinker, Napoleon Bonaparte. I want a pastry. All right, I'm going to take you back to the late 1700s, early 1800s, back when men dressed like women, women were property, kids were sex slaves. What is this, the Grammys? France, baby. France in the late 1700s, early 1800s. France was the powerhouse of Europe. Not so much anymore. That's the United States, although France is very good at soccer. King Louis, the XV1. I don't read Roman numerals, so I'll never know what that is, but King Louis, the XV1, and the royals, they used to party it up. They were partying, having a good time, and guess who was paying for it? The poor, okay? There was this huge wealth gap happening. France was on the precipice of a revolution. They had ideas from what they saw at the American Revolution, and the poor were mad because the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. Watch your back, Bill Gates. France is the center of the Enlightenment movement in Europe. They had the best silk, best silk trade. They had the large overseas empire. France was killing it. They were a powerhouse. That's why we called on them to help win our freedom from the British. Napoleon Bonaparte was born August 15th, 1769. I was born in August too. Were you a Virgo, Napoleon? I don't know my signs. In Ajaccio, which is on the Medi Mediterranean island of Corsica. Ajaccio. I don't know if that's by Sicily, but I'm going there in April. His dad's name was Carlo Bonaparte. This is a Carlo Colucci sweater. He was a lawyer. And Laetitia Romalino Bonaparte. So he had really like Italian kind of Mediterranean parents, but this little motherfucker was going to grow up in France. He had seven siblings and he was the second child. Okay, so... He had a lot of competition. That's what happens. A lot of times these dictators, they have they had a lot of competition at home or in the womb, and they're always fighting to prove that they're the best. He grew up speaking Italian and Corsican. I don't even know if Corsican is a language anymore. I have no idea. But if it is, it's probably on Babel. Use the promo code CHAOS. Just a year before Napoleon was born in 1768, France is just going around seizing land. They're just taking things like how the U.S. just takes little islands. We're taking them. But one of the islands we took was Corsica, which technically belonged to Italy. So technically, Napoleon was born in Italy, but it's going to become French property. So was Napoleon an Italian citizen? We don't know. But a lot of short people just want to be dictators who are from Italy. Napoleon, Mussolini, Leonardo DiCaprio, everybody just wants to take over the world. He was born Napoleoni, but then he changed his name later to Napoleon. That's a very interesting move. Napo I kind of like Napoleoni better. Hey, what's up, you little Napoleoni? So Napoleon enters the military, which is what everybody used to do back in the day. You have to understand, living back in these times, if you weren't in the military, then you were just gay. Literally, either you fought and died for your country or you lived the rest of your life like a homosexual. That's what the citizens looked at you as. And if you were living over 30, then they thought either you must have been a pussy and not fought in war and want to die for your country, or you love cock, or both. I would have thrived in this time. Napoleon didn't even learn French until he was 10 and he was bullied for his accent. That's not right. He got bullied for his accent. And today, instead of being a small dictator that would go on and try to take over the world, he would just go trans. That's what would happen today. And that's why the world's a safer place. Trans lives matter and they keep us safe. More trans cock in the military is what my platform is. Now, he did go on to graduate from the French Military Academy at 16 years old in 1785. Okay, 16 years old at, in 1785, which you're already at 16. You already are kind of a man. You already are going to be fighting in battles. If you're a woman, you're already a grandma. I mean, literally everybody in the old world was Puerto Rican. That's how, that's how everybody rolled. The French Revolutionary War comes right after the American Revolutionary War. The French Revolutionary War was so important. By the way, at this time, it was just like the shit to revolt against your kings and queens. That's what every country was doing. There were so many revolutions back in the day. Some people think this is actually the first world war because every country's getting involved. Everybody's gonna start fighting from all sides and it gets wild. So the French Revolutionary War begins when Napoleon's still young, but he's just getting out of military school. Now he does 
get a name later on in life for be, he starts to get well known in the French Revolutionary War. Now he can go one of two ways. We have George Washington, who got known in the French and Indian War, went on to become the president. And then we had Adolf Hitler, who got known in World War I and went on to become Adolf Hitler. So Napoleon's going to land somewhere in the middle. I would say Napoleon is in the gray zone, leans Hitler. Let me give you the short version, no disrespect, Napoleon, of the French Revolutionary War. Okay, here's what happened. Basically, the French Revolutionary War was sparked by corruption. The monarchy created this huge gap in the wealth classes. As I said, they were partying it up and the poor were paying. It begins with uh, military conflicts from 1792 until 1802. The citizens, okay, of France, they trusted the army more than anybody else, and they overthrew the monarchy. Remember, bye-bye Louis XV1 and Marie Antoinette, famous for saying, let them eat cake. And the poor are like, are you fucking kidding me? There's no protein in cake. I need protein, so I'm going to eat you. And they cut Louis XV1 and Marie Antoinette's head off with the guillotine. Whoops, what can you do? So they got their heads cut off. They, the storming of the Bastille. You've heard of the Bastille. It's a, a band now in England. Um, they, um, that is where this, they stormed the Bastille in the French Revolutionary War got the king and queen out, and they beheaded them right then and there. And this is all giving an uprising to Napoleon. You see, when you have a dictator, you ha the, the conditions need to be right. You need an angry people, group of people that feel like they've been stepped on by the powers that be, that are financially in trouble. They need someone to lead, and then they will follow and believe. And that's what's happening right here during and after this French Revolutionary War. You have a subdued people. You have an angry people that want to restore French, nationali French nationalism, and they say, we need a little chicken nugget of a man to do it, and that little chicken nugget is Napoleon Bonaparte. They say, we need a, a walking croissant, and here comes Napoleon. The French Revolutionary War goes from 1792 to 1802. That is 10 years of revolution. So Napoleon graduates military school 1785. Okay, as we said, the rumblings of the French Revolution are starting in like 1789, but Napoleon goes home. He's back in Corsica. He's hanging out with his Italian French babes and guys, gals, whatever he's doing. He's eating macaroni with French fries. He's just being a French Italian citizen, putting marinara sauce on cream puffs, and it's all wild. And he becomes friends with um, the Jacobins, which uh, was the, this um, de pro-democracy political group that were eventually responsible for the reign of terror in the French Revolution. So they were like, you know, good guys if you ask some people, bad guys if you ask others. He starts to kind of get in with them. He's like starting to think like, you know, we need a democracy here. What the F is France doing? Kings and queens, I hate them. 1794, Napoleon is actually fighting in the war, gets promoted to the rank of brigadier general in the army. So this little guy... He's like small but mighty, okay? I mean, he is working his way up. In seven, 1795, just one year later, he suppressed a royalist insurrection against a revolutionary government in Paris and was promoted to major general, okay? So this little short man went all the way up to major general in like a couple of years. So he's got, he may be a small guy, but he's got a big heart. Your boy's working hard, moving up, always working. Remember, size don't matter, babe. Just work, work, work. So let's take it to 1795. France, as always, is still at war with Britain. They're fighting themselves. They're fighting the British, whatever, whatever. And then a directory, which is a five-person group that was leading France post-revolution because they had no more king and queen, basically decide to let Napoleon lead an invasion of England. But Napoleon says, you know what? Our Navy is not good enough to fight the British Navy. This is a thing with great leaders. They kind of know when to fight and when not to fight. George Washington was the same. You know when to fight. You know when not to fight. That's why I'm with Jasmine. You, the, he knew, he said, rather than fighting them head on, why don't we invade Egypt? Yeah, didn't see that one coming. Let's invade Egypt and cut off the British trade routes with India. We'll, we'll kill the British by stopping the trade routes with India. Smart, smart, smart. He a little guy with a big brain. So they go to cut off the uh, profitable uh, trading outposts in India, went to Egypt, cut off all those British trading, uh, trading routes. And then when he crossed over to Egypt in 1798 with an entire army at his command, um, he basically, instead of just it being all about war and killing everybody and blood, he said, you know what, I'm going to go with scientists, I'm going to go with linguists, I'm going to go with scholars to advance the knowledge and get some Egyptian riches. You're going to see how this has a direct correlation to the Louvre in Paris in just a moment. And the Egyptians, they actually didn't mind the French scholars. They really didn't. I mean, listen, they were always drunk and banging their women and giving everybody STDs, but that's just what French people do. 
It's fine. But they, they love the openness of it. Like, not everything is all bad. Just because a country comes and invades you, sometimes it's nice. And Napoleon actually flattered the Egyptians, and he declared himself a worshiper of Islam. He was like the original Rachel Dolezal. So it wasn't actually all bad because they, he went into Egypt, got some riches, you know, stole their artifacts and started a museum. But I was like, no, but I love Islam. Don't even worry about it. Where's the carpet? Let me get down. He was all about that, but he was charismatic. Again, a charismatic guy whom everybody loved. And the main goal here was just to crush Britain, which they always wanted to do. And how about this little fun fact? One of the French scholars that went with Napoleon's invading army into Egypt is one of the people that's responsible for discovering Rosetta Stone, even though at this show we are Team Babel. So, like I said, Napoleon loved taking art. He just stole it, would convince himself that it was for him and he was destined to have it and blah, blah, blah. But the Louvre today is filled with a lot of things he stole from his travels and conquests. Some people say there's no Louvre without Napoleon. So all those artifacts that you have to wait in long lines to see, all Napoleon, stole most of them. Good for you. So now what's happened is Napoleon's getting really powerful and it's going to his head, okay? He's about to do a coup within a coup within a coup to seize his own power and it gets crazy. If you don't know what a coup is, I'm Chrissy Coup. I'll tell you the definition right now. It is a sudden or violent and unlawful seizure of power from a government. So that's what it is. Some people will say January 6th was an attempt at a coup. I wouldn't. The coup within a coup. By the way, it's spelled C-O-U-P. In America, we should just spell it C-O-O. Coo-coo. The five-person group that had governed France, as we said before, since 1795, is called the Directory. Today in America, that five-person group is called the Rothschilds. But back then, it was called the Directory. And they were experiencing a lot of corruption, and people were like, listen, you gotta go. So Napoleon teamed up with two other guys, and he got rid of the Directory in November 1799 in an event known as the Coup of 18 Brumaire. That's the name of it. 18 Brumaire sounds like a new hotspot. Sounds like a new Soho house that'll be in downtown Manhattan that Benetio will be going to. So Napoleon, he was successful in changing some of the laws. And basically one of those laws was he made himself counsel. That's usually the first law of these people. They say, you know what? I'm for you, the people. I'm going to change all the laws. Number one law, I have all the power. Now suck my French dick. So here's the coup within the coup. The first coup was overthrowing the directory in 1795 with these two other guys. Success. Then the second coup was Napoleon didn't tell his other two boys about this who were Roger Ducos and Sies. I don't know how they'll spell that, how to pronounce that, but it's spelled S-I-E-Y-E-S. Sies. Those were his two boys that he did the coup with to overthrow the directory. He then cooed against them. Unbeknownst to them, he said, you know what? You guys are out of here too. And he made all these new laws. And the first law, which every dictator always does, is they make believe that they're all for the people. And then the very first law is, okay, law number one, I have all the power. So come suck my French toast stick. All right, now with Napoleon, of course, we got to talk about his wife. Love and marriage, love and marriage. They go together like a revolution in Paris. Just thought of that. With all these wars going on, coups within coups, that makes a motherfucker horny. So Napoleon said, I got to get married. And in 1796, Napoleon marries Josephine de Bouchernais. I don't know how to say that, but it's B-E-A-U-H-R-N-A-I-S. Josephine de Bouchernais. She was a stylish widow, six years his senior, cougar. He, she already had two teenage children. He was 27. She was 33. This sounds very like my life. And it sounds like Josephine could be from a certain country that's in the Caribbean that my family likes to go to. And maybe they're even from. It sounds very much like that. Empress Josephine was from San Juan, France. I mean, France. Now, Napoleon was often on the road, like somebody I know. And, but he still had to carry out his military duties and campaigns. Therefore, he was, often, he was often writing letters and mailing them to Josephine. Her responses were less frequent, though. Basically, if, if he had a phone today, it, it's mad blues on his phone. Just mad blues. He's just sent, firing out DMs. Just, just, and then she's getting back like, dope, yes, hey, thumbs up. It's like humiliating. But this guy's horny. 
He's on a military conquest. He's got all the power. He's like, I'm gonna, I need to talk to her. I was thinking Valentine's Day is coming up. Why not read a couple of the letters from Napoleon to Josephine? It will spark some ideas for you guys and girls on what you should say to your lover. Now, Napoleon's love letters, some people may know about them, some people may not. They've been published. They were discovered. Let's read some of the letters that Napoleon wrote to Josephine. And you'll see they get increasingly crazier and crazier. But they start off cute. Like every psychotic ex-lover, it starts off cute, then it winds up with you having your head in your lap. So this is a letter from 1796. This is Napoleon talking to uh, Josephine. A kiss on your heart and one much lower down, much lower. How happy I would be if I could assist you at your undressing. The little firm white breast, or black or Asian or Puerto Rican. The adorable face, the hair tied up in the scarf, a la Creole. Cute, cute. Wants to touch her white titties, kiss on her heart, much lower down, wants to go down on her smelly vagina. It's all cute. Here we go. This is another cutie. I am awake or filled with you. Your image and the intoxicating pleasures of last night allow my senses no rest. I like it, Napoleon. It's cute. Getting a little crazy because you're saying that you want her inside of you, which is weird because I don't know that dildos were invented yet, but hey, go you. You're my little short king. Work. Here's another good one. It's starting to, you know, a little bit, get a little crazy, but still not bad. Things are going well here, but my heart is indescribably heavy. You are ill and far away from me. Be gay. Okay. And take care of yourself. You are worth more than all the universe to me. Please go take care of yourself. He's basically saying, hey, make sure you're getting your six month pap smear. Make sure you're doing your yoga. Make sure you're eating right because I need you to be healthy. I need that vagina to be smelly. I need to get inside you. So now things are starting to get a little crazy. I think he's starting to get a little homesick and he's starting to get a little suspicious that maybe she's cheating. I mean, the first off, first one, he goes, je ravine en trois jours. Ne te lave pas, which means, translates into English, home in three days, don't bathe. So it's like, um, okay, why do you want me to be dirty? Maybe it's just going a little cuckoo, but hey, it happens. Of what sort can be that marvelous being, that new lover that tyrannizes over your days and prevents your giving any attention to your husband? So now he's saying, not only do I need you to be smelly, but you're cheating on me. He's starting to get a little schizo. Okay, he's saying, don't bathe, which it happens because, and, and listen, hey, I know what that's like, okay? Because if I come right home and take a shower, Jazz is like, how was the girl you had sex with last night? I'm like, good. Then he says, Josephine, Josephine, remember what I've sometimes said to you. Nature has endowed me with a virile and decisive character. It has built yours out of lace and gossamer. Have you ceased to love me? Are these real? I mean, honestly, like Napoleon, like I'll read this letter. Like it, it, he, he's all over the place. He's like in love, but he's also crazy. I mean, this letter, it's like after I read this one, you're like, did this guy kill four college students in Idaho? I mean, wh who is this guy? He goes, forgive me, love of my life. My soul is racked by conflicting forces. My heart obsessed by you is full of fears with prostrate me with misery. I am distressed not to be calling you by your name. I shall wait for you to write it. And then in the same letter, he goes on to proclaim that she never really loved him. So he's like, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then literally five minutes later, he's like, farewell. Ah, if you love me less, you could never have loved me. In that case, I shall truly be pitiful. Okay, Jasmine, I didn't realize that you were also a dictator in France in the 1800s. Obviously, as expected, Napoleon and Josephine don't make it, okay? He says it's, he had the marriage annulled because she wouldn't give him in, uh, any kids. She couldn't have any kids because she already had like two teenage kids and she's 35 years old by now. It's like, you have no, I mean, this is the 1800s. It's like, you, if you were going to give a kid, you had to do it at 10. So that's, so he breaks up with her, but basically she was probably like, okay, great psycho. Thank you. Like for, she was probably happy. She was like, this guy's a lunatic. But in 1810, he wed Marie Louis, the daughter of the emperor of Austria. Uh-oh, getting close to Germany. The following year, she gave birth to their son. They had a nice little son. His name was Napoleon Francois Joseph Charles Bonaparte. And he had lived a short life, unfortunately, 1811 to 1832. But um, so that's bad. Um, you know, ki kids died back then. It happened. He was only 22 years old when he died. Now, back to taking over the world. We had the Concordat of 1801. Um, now, baby Napoleon, he does something uh, a little different than what most 
rulers were doing at the time. He gets the church behind him. Okay, the church comes up right behind him. There's no priest jokes there. I mean, I could insert a couple of priest jokes as priests inserted jokes into me, but this is just, I'm telling you that the church got behind him and that is not a pun on Catholic priests uh, being pedophiles. He basically made Catholicism the French religion, kind of how King Henry VIII made Protestantism the religion of England. Napoleon's making Catholicism the religion of France. He believed in religious freedom, so it was just primary, not official, actually. Sorry, I, I misspoke. It wasn't actually official. It was the primary religion. So you didn't actually have to, you know, practice Catholicism. It wasn't, you know, mandated. But if you didn't, you might get killed in these streets by Napoleon. And when the church is behind you, you're basically unstoppable, okay? When that church is behind you, just bending you over, you are unstoppable as Napoleon was or thought he was. So the Napoleon complex, was Napoleon short? The answer is probably not. If you don't know what the Napoleon complex is, that it's a def defined as a popular belief that short men tend to compensate for their lack of height through domineering behavior and or aggression. Of course, named after Napoleon, but it probably wasn't true because guess what? Napoleon was between, most scholars think, 5'6 and 5'8, which was just a little bit taller than the average height of French men at that time. Napoleon was a victim of fake news. It happens. You thought it all started with that certain somebody, but I got news for you. The original Donald Trump was a victim of it as well. The Napoleon complex came from actual British cartoonist James Gilray. He was beloved in Britain. And of course, England and France always at war with each other. So what James Gilray would do was he would make these cartoons to depict France losing different naval battles. And we'd always have Napoleon short but jacked. And so people all over Britain and therefore the world thought Napoleon is short and angry because that's what James Gilray was depicting in his cartoons. Napoleon actually said at one point in his life, James Gilray has done more to bring me down than all the armies of Europe combined. Nice choice of words, Napoleon. I like that you did a little pun there. You leaned it to your own joke. Bring me down. Smart. Napoleon wasn't as short as you think. So when you say that Napoleon complex about short guys, understand that you're kind of wrong. You're kind of right, but you're kind of wrong because short guys are just mean and they do overcompensate. And you never want to fight a short guy because if they get you at their ankles, they'll start gnawing at him and you're going to lose the fight. Trust me. But short guys do have big, big penises. So I'm not short. Whether he was short or not was definitely angry and definitely wanted power. 1802, he made, him, he made himself consul for life. 1804, he just made himself emperor. He was like, you know what? Forget about the council. Forget about everything. I'm just going to be the goddamn emperor. He crowned himself emperor of France. Hello, narcissism. 1804, he crowns himself emperor, and then the Napoleonic Code was born. He basically just compares himself to Justinian I. Um, he's obsessed with Roman culture, ancient Rome, which is like a red flag. This guy's just like, you know, it's, it's the early 1800s. You're acting like BC. It's weird. He has this identity crisis. He's just obsessed with the Roman Empire. A lot of people get obsessed with the Roman Empire. Hitler, Napoleon, Mussolini. The Roman Empire eventually dies and breaks down. People forget that. It's like, yeah, it's fun to, you know, watch Russell Crowe as a gladiator, but understand that that entire empire crumbled. And now it's just one little small country, Italy and Sicily, which I'm going to in April. So Napoleon in 1804 is walking around like he's an old school Roman emperor because that's what he wanted. He, oh, he was obsessed with ancient Rome, the good old days. Everybody gets so obsessed with the good old days. Let me remind you, the good old days are happening right now. Be present. What is the Napoleonic Code of 1804? So standardized laws for family, citizenship, and property. That's nice. Property laws were changed. The main decision was these laws across France instead of province to province. So it was kind of just one France. We're not divided into little things. It's like everything, what's good for all, what's good for the country is good for you. Uh, women's rights were stripped during this time, which just tends to happen is people just get power and then they say, the women got to go. Uh, so women couldn't own property. Uh, the wages that were made on their own were not theirs. They were their husbands or the men's. They couldn't serve as witnesses in court. Uh, they have control over guardianship of their children. If they committed adultery, if they cheated, they were sent to jail, uh, while men had to just pay a fee. That's one rule I do like. Let's go. Oh, I, I'd like to bring back certain parts of the Napoleonic Code. JK, JK. So here's the thing with Napoleon, right? He's proclaiming to be so progressive and all he wants is change, but that's not what he's doing. He's changing laws. He's doing what's best for himself. Hello, AOC. 
here's the thing with Napoleon. He's another misunderstood person in history. You know, he wasn't that short. You know, even though we think he was, you know, he actually had this sweet side to him. And although, you know, he was taking the rights away from women and being a dick, he also was being progressive in other ways. He was paving the way for modernization. Schools were founded for science, technology, engineering schools. He sponsored the creation of Lycees, a.k.a. high schools. Um, so, yeah, for people to get shot at. People around Europe are imitating the French legal and education system and soon around the world. I mean, we pretty much have a French legal system here that's pretty much spawned off that um and he was changing the world i mean babes were getting more educated which is a good good thing and with more educated people that means more progress to certain issues and sharing ideas with people and with so much chaos in france napoleon came through and he put an end to it uh by making himself leader aka the dictator so it's interesting he's just a coin flip of a guy now from 1803 to 1815 we had the napoleonic wars which were major, major conflicts with various coalitions of European nations. He just basically wanted to conquer all of Europe. The guy just wanted to conquer, like Alexander the Great, like Hitler, like Bill Gates. The guy just wants it all. Now, he would draft young men, 20 to 24. Uh, what about the women, Napoleon? And then Napoleon himself would actually fight next to them, which is nice. He would go into the battles with them. So the soldiers kind of loved him for that. Like, if you were a true French patriot, you loved Napoleon. Because, like, this guy rides or dies. He fucks with us. He fucks with France. He got German and Austrian territory, and he brought men from there. He just kept conquering. He got the little Germans, got the little Austrians, and this is that's why Hitler liked him. Hitler was like, oh, yeah, Napoleon, he was kind of German. It was all weird connections. Um, he made his brothers the leaders of uh, the newly conquered lands, surrogate monarchs, he called them. Um, so, but you know, anytime you're making your, you know, you know, what does Biggie say? Keep your family and business completely separated. 10 crack commandments. So Napoleon should have been listening to Biggie, but he wasn't because he was killed by the government. Here's where Napoleon's first downfall and first abdication comes. And here's where it pays to be a fan of history. Okay. This is something Adolf Hitler should have known about Napoleon, but he forgot. Napoleon made the same crucial mistake that a lot of leaders who are trying to conquer Europe try to make. He tried to take over Russia. Do not do that. Because what happened was is Russia had withdrawn from the continental system. And in retaliation, Napoleon led a massive army into Russia in the summer of 1812. That's stupid. You're not going to take over Russia. It's too big. He was determined to take all of Russia. He got his army up to six, 700,000 men, went across Europe, started invading the Russian lands. Well, they got there and the men were so tired because you have to trek across literally hundreds of thousands of miles, not hundreds of thousands of miles, that's ridiculous, but you know, a lot of miles. In the summer and the Russian army, they actually refused to engage in battle and instead they burned the land so Napoleon's army couldn't use the natural resources and everyone starved to death. So the, you're just not gonna beat them. It's impossible to beat them on their own, own land. So even though French did win a good enough amount, as winter approached, conditions got so bad that the army couldn't replenish their supplies. They called for backup. Backup couldn't come and they gave up and they returned with like 100,000 guys. And they, uh, all right, they got, uh, you know, they came back to Poland. They, they got back to Poland and we're like, yeah, all right, look, we got Poland. We want a Russia, but here's Poland. Have a Kawumki. 1814, Napoleon's in his mid 40s when Austria, Prussia, Russia, and Swedish troops defeat the French in a combined forces to stop him from continuing his dictatorship. So on April 6, 1814, Napoleon was forced to abdicate his throne. Okay, they didn't cut his head off. They didn't do a Marie Antoinette guillotine, but the guy had to give up his throne with the Treaty of Fontainebleau, which I'll be at Fontainebleau in my March 31st of Miami show is sold out. He was exiled to Elba, not Idris Elba. That'd be nice. A Mediterranean island off the coast of Italy. He's, he's in exile, he's chilling, and on February 26, 1815, after a year of exile off Idris Elba, Italy, Napoleon escapes Elba, and he sails to France and returns to Paris, where he was welcomed by cheering crowds. So this is like an insane story. He gets exiled, is on exile. People are like, oh, I guess we'll never see Napoleon again. The guy comes back in his little boats, and the French crowd loves him. They literally, he went away for a few years. People realized how much they missed him and he came back and the people were clapping. Donald Trump. Now the new king, Louis XV111, fled and Napoleon began what was known as the 100 Days Campaign. So literally the king got so scared, he just left. King Louis XV111 was like, bye, bye, bye. Because he knew Napoleon, he knew the crowds loved Napoleon. That's the thing. He literally, the King Louis XV one on one, just ran away in his diaper because he knew that the people supported Napoleon. So upon Napoleon's uh, return to France, 
all these countries, Austria, Britain, Prussia, Russia, they all considered the French uh, emperor an enemy. They made another coalition and they began to prepare for war. So, but Napoleon said, you know what? I'm going to raise an army of my own, son. And he planned to strike preemptively. He said, that's what you learn in the art of war is you got to strike first sometimes, baby. And he was like, I'm going to defeat the allied forces one by one so they cannot launch an attack against me. Now we come to the Battle of Waterloo, one of the most famous battles um, in Napoleon history. They actually named a town in upstate New York after this battle which I'm sure the French are happy about. Great. We got, we're, we're, we're remembered in upstate New York. In June 1815, Napoleon's forces invade Belgium because they're like, they got chocolate. And British and Russian troops are stationed there. And on June 16th, Napoleon's troops defeated the Prussians at the Battle of Ligny. But two days later, on June 18th, at the Battle of Waterloo near Brussels, a.k.a. Brussels Sprouts, the French were crushed by the British with assistance from the Prussians. And this is kind of... The beginning of the end for Napoleon, because then in October of 1815, Napoleon gets exiled again to the remote British held island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic Ocean. And this is where, unfortunately, the kid's going to die. Here's the thing. He dies on May 5th, 1821 at age 51, most likely from stomach cancer, because here's the bottom line. If you're going to eat vagina, it's got to be clean. And he insisted on Josephine's being dirty, and that's just going to give you cancer, babe. There was no guard cell back then. Now, during his time in power, Napoleon often posed for paintings. He always had his hand in his vest, leading some to speculate that after his death, he had been plagued by the stomach pain. That's what people think, because he was always like this, Ugh, my stomach hurt. But I'm telling you, I don't think it was stomach cancer. I think it was just eating that dirty snatch. Napoleon got buried on this British island, St. Helena, despite his request to be laid to rest on the banks of the Seine River um, among the French people I've loved so much. So they said, no, no, no. Unfortunately, no. And uh, he got buried there. But in 1840, his remains were returned to France and entombed in a crypt in Paris uh, where other French military leaders are interred. So nowadays in France, Napoleon is kind of not hated. He's kind of loved. He got, I mean, who gets exiled twice? In summary, Napoleon Bonaparte, listen, he's 50-50, right? He was a child of revolution in so many ways, but yet he also destroyed revolutionary ideals as the emperor. He won a lot of wars for France, but then that resulted in death and millions of dollars in, in debt and all that. He got exiled by the French people, then got welcomed back by the French people, then got exiled again. So he's just kind of one of those guys that lives in the gray zone. Either you love him or hate him. He's the original Donald Trump. That's the best way I can describe him. What do you guys think? Comment below. What do you think of this video? What did we miss? What do you want to hear about Napoleon? Napoleon said one of my favorite quotes of all time. Napoleon said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. And that's the truth. And always remember, yesterday was history. That's not a lie.